down. It's that time again to talk boxing. I'm just flipping through the Bible of the sport, the ring record book and boxing encyclopedia. They've got the heavyweight champions listed by the man who beat the man who beat the man. that sound it's that time again to talk boxing i'm just flipping through the bible of the sport the ring record book and boxing encyclopedia they've got the heavyweight champions listed by the man who beat the man who beat the man and it's sad that boxing doesn't really have that anymore but we start with jack dempsey 1914 he beat young herman and his career lasted until he lost to gene tunney in 1927 he retired the next year he once said that any boxing champion had to have two things the big punch and the ability to take a big punch. In other words, steel fists and an iron jaw. Dempsey had both, and that's why he was the world heavyweight champion from 1919 through 1923. After he retired, he came to the city he loved, New York, and he used to hold court at his restaurant across from the old Madison Square Garden, 8th Avenue and 50th Street. And much like the way Babe Ruth used to call everyone kid, because he couldn't remember their names, Dempsey greeted fans by saying, hiya, pal. Here he is from Manassa, Colorado, the Manassa Mauler, Jack Dempsey. This is the story of a miner from a small town known as Manassa, Colorado. In time, he would become a legend. In the age of the Roaring Twenties, one sports hero lived both as a gallant warrior and a worshipped celebrity. He was the perfect folk hero with the power of the press. He also possessed a furious right-left combination. Between the years 1919 and 1923, he reigned as the heavyweight champion of the world, with the status of a king ruling his country. Adoring fight fans flocked to stadiums as never before in these glamour years of boxing. Thousands upon thousands gathered at mammoth stadiums to catch a glimpse of one of America's favorite sons. Many regard him as the first superstar of the ring, and no fighter ever commanded the public limelight like the man they used to call the Manasseh Mola. This is the story of one of boxing's best, Jack Dempsey. HBO Sports presents Boxing's Best. story of Jack Dempsey. And now here's your host in New York City, Barry Tompkins. This is Grand Central Station, at one time the crossroads of America. It was in 1916 that Jack Dempsey and his then manager Jack Price came here to Grand Central with a total of $30 in their pockets between them. The idea was to establish a reputation as a tough boxer for Jack Dempsey, but nobody would really listen, with two exceptions. Jim Price of the New York Press, and the legendary Damon Runyon. Barney Nagler has been around the sport of boxing and been writing about the sport of boxing for more than 40 years. And Barney, what was it like to establish a reputation for a guy who was sort of a carnival character like Jack Dempsey? Well, then boxing was quite different from what it is now in New York State and elsewhere. Those were the days of what was known as the Frawley Law in New York State. There was a law under which boxing was permitted between members of the same club, no decisions were rendered. Uh, and the only way a man really could win was by knockout. So that in order to win a fight, uh, uh, a man had to score a knockout. But there was betting on those fights. The betting was based on what was called the uh, newspaper decisions. Uh, if uh, I bet you $100 and I say Dempsey would knock out his opponent uh, or Dempsey would win, uh, we'll bet on the opinion of Damon Runyon. The next day, you'd pick up Runyon's paper, and uh, you, if Runyon said, well, I think that Nagler won the fight, at least it looked that way from the Southwest corner, you collected. Otherwise, you lost. Uh, that, let, that was quite different from the boxing as we know it today. Uh, boxing was a very important uh, part of the sports spectrum. Uh, big league baseball there was no pro football college there was no pro basketball so the boxing was a very important part 
interesting to me, I think, everybody thought of Jack Dempsey as being a pretty big guy, but when he fought Willard, Willard was the giant. Dempsey went in, I believe, at 185 pounds. No, it was, uh, you're close enough, 182 pounds. And he was a very small man alongside of Willard. And at that time, there was some question about whether uh, Dempsey would survive such a fight. And Willard, uh, I understand, that I, I've been told, was the favorite. Uh, Dempsey was the small man. Dempsey had to be the giant killer. But Dempsey was a fierce man, and that made the difference. It happened in July 1919. The scene was Toledo, Ohio. Heavyweight championship, Jack Dempsey, and the champion, Jess Willard. July 4th, 1919. Jack Dempsey is scheduled to meet Jess Willard for the heavyweight championship of the world. On the morning of the fight, Jack actually sparred and hit the punching bags before the weigh-in. Jess Willard approached Jack Kearns, Dempsey's manager, and asked about legal immunity in case he killed the challenger. Tex Rickard had masterminded one of the greatest spectacles in boxing history. Tex had an immense wooden stadium built in Toledo, Ohio, to house the huge crowds he expected. The cost? $100,000 worth of green lumber. As it turned out in the hot sun, the sap from the unseasoned wood ruined many a spectator's double-breasted suit. Inside the stadium, 2,000 women, including actress Ethel Barrymore, are seated in a special section fenced off by barbed wire. This forever ended the custom of all male fight crowds. When Dempsey comes in the ring, the temperature is a torrid 112 degrees. Willard arrives, gracefully acknowledges the crowd's enthusiastic welcome. The symbolic heavyweight championship belt is displayed. The fighters meet in the center of the ring to pose for the cameras. Jess Willard does not seem to be in the rock-hard shape he was against Jack Johnson four years earlier. But what a difference in size between champion and challenger. Moments before the opening bell, Dempsey rubs rosin on his feet. First round, the bell rings, but no one hears it because of the clamor of the crowd. Jess Willard stands confused, looking around. There's a second bell. The most exciting first round in heavyweight history is underway. The fight starts calmly. But keep an eye on Dempsey. Although outweighed by almost 80 pounds, he has bet $10,000 at 10 to 1 odds that he will knock the champion out in the first round. Four dynamite punches, and Willard is down for the first time in his eight year career. The crowd surges to its feet. When the champion rises, Dempsey leaps after him, drives Jess toward the ropes. Willard goes down to the second of what will prove to be seven knockdowns. Dempsey pounces to the attack again. Rain punches on the floundering champion. There was no neutral corner rule in 1919, and Dempsey is allowed to stand over the fallen fighter, ready to swing as soon as both knees leave the canvas. Crashing blow to the ribs, then Jess down again. Wheeler desperately tries to fend off the raging challenger. brutal punches. The champion staggers across the ring. He's down again. The referee pushes Dempsey away. Willard pulls his battered body erect, only to be floored for the seventh time. Referee Ollie Picard is counting over the incredibly game champion. The bell rings, saving Willard from a first-round knockout, but no one hears it because of the fantastic uproar. 
Dempsey leaves the ring thinking he has won the championship and his 10 to 1 side bet, a $100,000 payoff. Meanwhile, Willard's handlers attend to him, desperately trying to ready Jess for the second round. With jaw broken and two ribs cracked, the battered champion is led to his corner. Dempsey's manager, Jack Doc Kearns, runs over and starts screaming after the young fighter. Jack, come back! Jack, come back! The mammoth Willard not only lasts through round two, but he's still on his feet here in round three. Dempsey is relentless on the attack. But in the blazing Toledo sun, Jess Willard is proving what is meant by the saying, he went out like a champion. After the third round, Willard's handlers insist that he not answer the fourth round bell. Jack Dempsey forges an instant legend as the Manassa Mormon. He has won the heavyweight championship in one of the most savage battles in ring history. The crowd was upset, calling Willard a quitter. Jack Dempsey took home over $27,000 and the heavyweight crown. Later, Jack awoke in the middle of the night, dreaming that Willard had knocked him out. Then Jack ran out into the street, bought a newspaper, and read the big print. Jack Dempsey, heavyweight champion of the world. Hour gives you access to the largest boxing library in the world. Here's what you can check out in this library. Rare footage of classic fighters, the stories from outside the ring, and volumes of the greatest action in boxing history. Every week, Al Bernstein puts you ringside for classic fights you can't see anywhere else. Ali, Marciano, Leonard, Lewis, plus hard-hitting fighters every boxing fan ought to know. Big Fights Boxing Hour, Tuesday at 10, only on ESPN Classic. This is ESPN Classic. Two years later, on July 2nd, 1921, the Manasseh Mauler defended his crown against French war hero Georges Carpentier in boxing's first million-dollar gate. Jack had received adverse publicity for deferring enlistment in World War I due to family need. Carpentier was a big hit in the U.S. from the moment his boat docked. The riders had what they wanted. The war hero battling the black sheep. Ferocious looking Jack Dempsey with two days' growth of beard. Meanwhile, incredulous tellers were totaling the gate receipts. The total was $1,800,000. The first million dollar gate in boxing history. The two men shake hands for the cameras. The fight starts two hours earlier than scheduled. The wooden stands were filled to overflowing by noon. And Tex Rickard became worried that they would collapse before he got the fight underway. The Dempsey Carpentier fight was the social event of 1921. The list of people who attended reads like a society and entertainment world who's who. Rockefeller, Ford, Vanderbilt, Whitney, Gould, Harriman, Baruch, Astor. Flo Ziegfeld of Follies fame was there. So was John Ringling of the Circus, Colonel Jacob Rupert of the Yankees, George M. Cohan, Al Jolson. It was the in place to be on July 2nd, 1921. Dempsey, as usual, is pressing the fight, using his greater weight and power. Round two, Carpentier gets home with his best weapon, his potent right hand. Dempsey is hurt. The crowd goes wild as George tries to press his advantage. American fight fans across the country were listening to the fight on the first live coast-to-coast -coast radio hookup. Fourth round, Dempsey has taken charge. George misses with a desperate flurry. Dempsey is after him. A sharp left, right, and Carpentier is down. The Frenchman looks like he's out cold, but jumps up at nine. Two more punches, and George is down again. 
This time, he does not rise. Jack pocketed $300,000 in this unpopular title defense. Because this was the first broadcast of a fight on radio, Jack Dempsey's image had been damaged by the resounding boos from the crowd of 93,000. When Jack returned to New York City, he was a heavyweight champion without the support of the American public. These are the offices of Ring Magazine here in New York, the Bible of the sport of boxing. Matt Fleischer was the founder of Ring Magazine, and not incidentally, it was he who was behind the microphone of that first ever radio broadcast of a heavyweight championship fight. It was also Matt Fleischer who, in large part, was responsible for bringing to the attention of New York City and the national press a young Jack Dempsey. Ray Arcel has been around the sport of boxing for some 63 years, handling champions all the way from Benny Leonard to Roberto Duran, seen a lot come and a lot go. Ray, let me ask you about Jack Dempsey. He was a guy who was not always the most popular fighter. There were times when he was, but there were times when he wasn't. Well, of course, when he fought Carpentier, they built Carpentier up as a great war hero. And uh, they had to do something in order to be able to sell the match. Dempsey was such an outstanding figure and such a great fighter that uh, uh, they uh, had to write some complimentary stories about Pontier, and naturally they delved on the great war hero and the great war record. It is interesting, I think, Ray, in this day and age, a Sugar Ray Leonard fights a Larry Bonds, who actually is a rank fighter, and the public says that's a mismatch. Jack Dempsey, in 1921, after he fought Carpentier, did not fight again until 1923, other than exhibitions, and when he did, he fought Tommy Gibbons, who was unranked. I would think if that happened in this day and age, that people would just demand more out of a champion. Well, I don't think you know uh, Tom Gibbons. Tom Gibbons was a great fighter. He was one of the best light heavyweights and heavyweights that we had. And of course, he, uh, he was an excellent performer, a uh, great defensive boxer, and it was a good fight for uh, Dempsey because he needed the work and he was getting ready to fight a, a very important fight. He wanted to fight. And his manager did not want him to fight. Well, Kearns felt that he should box exhibitions and go on the stage and earn money that way. And then when a big fight came along, that he would be ready for it. But Jack thought differently because he wanted to be very active. Whether on the streets or behind bars. You're home with me, son. Do you understand me? Gibbons in the dark trunk starts out with his defensive fight plan. He had never been knocked out or even floored during his 12-year career. He backs away, ties up the champion. On July 4th, 1923, Jack Dempsey traveled to the little-known town of Shelby, Montana to meet Tommy Gibbons. Dempsey was guaranteed $300,000. Gibbons fought for nothing. Gibbons in the dark truck starts out with his defensive fight plan. He has never been knocked out or even floored during his 12-year career. away, ties up the champion. Fifteenth round, Tommy Gibbons has planned his strategy too cautiously. Dempsey is far ahead on point because of his aggressiveness. The fight is over. Jack retains his title by a clear-cut decision. After the fight, the town of Shelby went bankrupt. In order to fulfill Dempsey's guarantee, the town had to hand over almost all of the sparse gate receipts. The arena that had been built was unpaid for. Dempsey and Kearns were not very popular by the time they had left. Two months later, Jack prepared for his return to the polo grounds to face Luis Firpo from Buenos Aires. He would be greeted with yet another million-dollar gate. Luis Firpo was nicknamed the Wild Bull of the Panthers and had knocked out 42-year-old Jess Willard in eight rounds. At first, Firpo didn't want to fight Jack Dempsey, but Tex Rickard had persuaded him to challenge for the title. What transpired was one of the most bizarre fights in heavyweight history. On the night of the fight, September 14, 1923, 80,000 fans crowded into the polo grounds in New York City. It was Tex Rickard's second million-dollar gate. 
famous ring announcer, Joe Humphreys, introduces the fighters. In just seconds, Furpo and champion Jack Dempsey will collide in the most spectacular fireworks display ever to take place inside a boxing ring. With two savage brawlers in there, everyone expects lightning to strike. And they are not to be disappointed. Dempsey gets in first, giving the Argentinian his own special version of an American welcome. Jack Dempsey tastes blood, and as usual, he wants to end it here and now. Purple is down again. But still the champion does not dream that in the next two minutes, he will be locked in one of the most unbelievable seesaw contests in sporting annals. Dempsey seems to be having it all his way, as Furpo is down again. But Jack is about to taste the power and strength that allows the Argentinian to continue to absorb such a barrage. A blunderbuss right catches the unsuspecting champion coming in and floors him for a one count. An enraged Dempsey storms right back. Furpo drops. That is the seventh of what will prove to be a record nine first round knockdown. There's number eight. Dempsey charges in for the kill. But the giant challenger fends him off with a desperate flurry of wide arm punches. Dempsey retreats before the sudden onslaught. A right hand from the bleachers, and Dempsey is out of the ring. The first time in the history of pugilism that a heavyweight champion suffers such indignity. But Dempsey is boosted back into the ring by ringside reporters. And the struggle goes on. Dempsey's fabled jaw again stands him in good stead as he hangs on through the fog. There's the bell. Somehow, both fighters have survived this most savage first round. Dempsey comes out fresh, and the fans brace themselves, wondering what possibly can be coming next. Dempsey is getting off. Turpo is down for the tenth knockdown of the fight. He's up. Furpo will try to fend off Dempsey with another overhand right. But the champion now seems definitely in charge. Two pulverizing left hooks and Louis Angel Furpo is down for the 11th knockdown. Eight, nine, ten, and out. After the fight. Jack Dempsey collected $550,000 directly from promoter Tex Record. Jack Kearns was furious, but the champion by this time distrusted his manager. And Jack Dempsey was tired of having his life programmed by Doc Kearns. Instead, he lived the life of a celebrity. His new wife, actress Estelle Taylor, convinced him to have his nose done. Naturally, the new Jack Dempsey made his way to Hollywood and Broadway. 44th and Broadway in New York City. That's just the kind of place that Jack Dempsey would come after a tough fight like the one with Luis Furpo. Bonnie Nagler, I would have to think, that fight with Furpo had to be, from a spectator point of view, one of the great fights in history. What really happened when Dempsey went out of the ring? Well, when Dempsey was knocked out of the ring, he landed on, on a judge, Kid McFarland. Legend has it that he landed on 48 typewriters of 48 newspaper men working. But actually, it was Kid McFarland, a tall man who was a fight judge and who was judging that fight in in pushing Dempsey back up onto the apron he turned and pushed him onto the typewriter of uh, a newspaper man now that typewriter was sold 78 times as the typewriter upon which Dempsey fell well that was in 1923 Jack Dempsey did come back to Broadway he was not want for liking of the bright lights was he Dempsey uh, was not uh, a he was not a, a Broadway guy, but he liked Broadway. He married four times. Twice he married stage people. Uh, he uh, played in, in, on the stage. He, uh, he caroused on Broadway. Uh, it was his life. After, once he had been touched and had seen the lights of Broadway, nothing else, not, not 
not the prairies nor the ranches of the West could contain them again. And after Luis Purpo, really, again, it was three years until his next big fight with Gene Tunney. Ray Arcel might have said it best. He said, to rest is to rust. Do you agree with that? Yes, that was actually three years and three months. And when, he, when Dempsey came back, he was not the man he had been before. It's interesting. The New York State refused to permit the Dempsey-Tunney fight to take place in New York because the, there was a black challenger named uh, Harry Wills. And so the fight, went to, uh, the fight went to Philadelphia first, and the second fight was in Chicago. In each of those cities, they permitted 10-round title fights, while in uh, New York, they would have had to fight 15 rounds. Dempsey could not have stood up for 15 rounds, much less fight 15 rounds. Finally, it was in September of 1926, the first of two classic fights, Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney. September 23, 1926. When Jack arrived in Philadelphia to face a very tough Gene Tunney, he was sick to his stomach. He actually swallowed olive oil to aid his digestion. Some of Jack's handlers suggested that he postpone the fight, but the champion insisted the fight go on. Gene Tunney came into the fight with 25 consecutive wins. The fighting Marine was ready for his opportunity of a lifetime. What do you dream of? When Challenger Gene Tunney steps into the ring in Philadelphia's sesquicentennial stadium. Champion Dempsey arrives to be greeted by the roar of 125,000 excited fans. The largest paid crowd ever to attend a single sporting event. Rain starts to fall as the fighters are introduced, but there is no thought of postponing the fight. With his third billion-dollar gate already in hand, Tex Rickard is going to stage this match come hell or high water. Dempsey, as usual, starts pressing the fight. At first, the challenger seems cautious, but watch closely the man who has already proved himself to be the finest boxer of the era. combination. The immense crowd is surprised that Tunney has obviously planned to take the fight right to Dempsey. Through the first nine rounds, as the rain continues to fall, Tunney continues to pile up points. But this isn't the thunderous Dempsey that rallied to destroy Bill Brennan and Louis Furpo years earlier. This is a tiring champion repeatedly being beaten to the punch. It looks like Dempsey is the one in danger of being KO'd. Tony gets off another combination. demonstrated this kind of counter-punching prowess all through this 10-round fight. It's over. Both fighters stand waiting in the now driving rain. No fans have left as everyone awaits the decision. Gene Tunney was the new heavyweight champion of the world. Jack Dempsey was a disappointed and exhausted fighter. Jack was so depressed after the loss, he announced his retirement from the ring. But nobody took his words seriously. Tex Rickard proposed a rematch with Tunney, but Jack signed to fight Jack Sharkey. Dempsey lost 22 pounds for the fight, but still weighed 205. The ex-champ was saddened by his brother's suicide. On July 21st, 1927, 84,000 arrived at Yankee Stadium, creating boxing's first million-dollar gate for a non-title bout. First round. Dempsey 
Kelsey on the left gets belted by a beautiful left hook and a follow-up volley of punches. He's hurt, but his now famous granite jaw stands him in good stead as he holds on. Dempsey on the left is far behind on points. He starts going after Sharkey's body. Dempsey wails away at Sharkey's midsection. As the younger man turns to the referee, Dempsey whips in a left hook to Sharkey's exposed chin. He's writhing on the canvas, claiming Dempsey punched low. But Sharkey has committed boxing's most grievous sin, leaving himself unprotected. Dempsey wins by a seventh round knockout. The comeback had begun. Tex Rickard immediately began setting up a return match with Tunney. Jack and Estelle's relationship was strained over Jack's commitments to the ring. After coming so far back, the Manasseh Mauler knew there was no stopping the inevitable confrontation with Gene Tunney. There was not an empty seat here in Yankee Stadium up in the Bronx, New York on that night in 1927. 84,000 people were there for the Jack Charkey. Jack Dempsey fight, and one of those 84,000 was you, Ray Arcel. Yes. Always seemed to be controversy around a Jack Dempsey fight, and this was no exception. They talked about a low blow. How did you see all of that? Well, it was difficult to see low blows at that time because Dempsey was throwing a lot of punches, and he drew a combination of left hook to the body and left hook to the chin. I mean, when he hit uh, Sharkey, and Sharkey complained about a foul that a referee well, he got hit with a left hook on his chin, and he got knocked out. So there had been a lot of controversy. Newspaper men differed in their uh, opinions. Some saw it, and others didn't. And of course, controversy exists. Ray, let me ask you, first of all, what kind of a guy Jack Dempsey was in terms of confidence? He was a guy that after the first Tunney fight, he said, that's enough, I don't want to box anymore. And there seemed to be other times where he sort of questioned his own confidence. Well, he had made up his mind to retire, and I think Estelle Taylor, his wife at that time, wanted him to retire. And of course, they uh, went on a trip. He came back, he, he became ill, and uh, he lost his brother Johnny, who was uh, one of his, uh, he really loved him. And uh, they influenced him that the Tunney fight was the one fight that he should make and that he could regain his, his title. And they figured they'd give him a tune-up fight with Jack Sharkey, and he won that fight, uh, he didn't, even though there was controversy. But uh, he set out and he went to Saratoga and trained for the Tunney fight and actually got himself in pretty fair shape because he had to go at a pretty fast clip for 10 rounds. The Tunney had gained a lot of confidence being the champion, and he was a very determined man in his own right, and very capable, one of the truly great fighters we had who never reached his peak. I'm looking at a dress. Well, the city of New York clamored for the second Dempsey Tunney fight. They would have loved to have had it right here in Yankee Stadium, where they did so well with the Jack Sharkey non-title fight. That was a million-dollar gate. But Tex Rickard, ever the promoter, figured he could get a bigger ringside ticket price in Chicago. He could get $40 there and just $27.50 here in the city of New York. So he took the fight there, and the day the ticket office opened, it went over a million-dollar gate. September 22, 1927. By fight time, the gate had amounted to over $2,600,000. Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney squared off in Chicago's Soldier Field in one of the most controversial fights in boxing history. Over 100,000 fans, a live crowd greater than any attendance at any baseball game, watches as the first round of one of boxing's most controversial fights begins. Tunney is wearing the light-colored trunks. The fifth and final million-dollar gate under the promotional reigns of Tex Rickard. This fight sets the record that may never be broken. Two million six hundred and fifty thousand dollars official gross receipts from a live gate. Champion Gene Tunney will receive a cool one million dollars for 40 minutes work. The fight itself follows a pattern similar to the first match. Dempsey lands a potent right-hand counter, follows up with a series of seven devastating punches. Tunney goes down for the first time in his career. 
Dempsey stays near the fallen fighter. But referee Dave Barry points for Jack to move to a neutral corner. Only then does he begin the count. Is Tony dazed, or is he wisely taking full advantage of these precious extra seconds? Tony is up at the referee's count of nine. Now, watch that sequence again in freeze action with a stopwatch on the knockdown. Tony has just hit the canvas, and we start the watch at zero. Jack has forgotten the new rule. The count does not begin until he gets to a neutral corner. Instinctively, Dempsey stays nearby. Five seconds have elapsed before referee Barry is ready to begin the count. Gene looks hurt, dazed as the count begins. But here at the official count of four, when nine seconds have actually elapsed, he is looking at the referee and picks up the numbers. You be the judge. Could Tony have risen at this point? At the referee's count of nine, but after 14 seconds have elapsed, Gene is getting off the canvas. Then, unabashedly, he gets on a bicycle to stay away from the rampaging Dempsey, who had scored only after 17 rounds of maddening frustration. By the eighth round, Tunney has fully recovered. Slow motion, watch him get in with a right that drops Dempsey for a one count. Notice here the referee incorrectly will start his count immediately after Jack's knee touches and before Gene could get to a neutral corner. Round 10. Tunney has taken complete charge. Bruised and exhausted, Jack Dempsey seems at the verge of being knocked out for the first time in 10 years. There's the bell. The fight is over. Gene Tunney overwhelmingly the winner. But the long count gives sporting buffs something to discuss whenever they get together. Jack Dempsey knew at the age of 32 it was time to hang up the gloves. He pocketed $450,000 for the rematch, while Tunney earned close to a million. When Tex Rickard tried to make a third match, Jack feared for his health and turned down $1 million. When the Depression hit, Jack Dempsey, like millions of other Americans, fell upon hard times. He lost $3 million, and eventually Estelle Taylor filed for divorce. He fought numerous exhibitions and invested in the Jack Dempsey restaurant. Then things began to get better, and the Manassa Mauler lived the comfortable life of an ex-champion. Some folks. On July 1st in 1940, Jack Dempsey decided to give adoring fans one last farewell. In what turned into a farcical and absurd contest, Jack took on Cowboy Luttrell, Dempsey was introduced as the most popular sports figure in history. It was a title he had earned. Dempsey, former champion of the world after losing to Gene Tunney, is attempting a comeback. Dempsey has shown a lot of his old fire, scoring nine knockouts and nine fights in a seven-month period. Cowboy Luttrell weighs 236 pounds for this fight. Jack Dempsey scales 211 pounds. You can see Luttrell is built like an ox. He can give and take a lot of punishment. Early in the fight, Dempsey goes to work on Luttrell. It's Dempsey with punishing lefts and rights. Luttrell is hurt, but is tough and courageous and stays on his feet. This is something of a grudge fight, because four months ago, Dempsey had refereed a match in which Luttrell was one of the contestants. Luttrell took a swing at him. A near riot ensued, and this match was made between Dempsey and Luttrell. Here in the second round, it's almost impossible to see what holds Luttrell up, as Dempsey throws everything but the kitchen sink. Luttrell goes down. He's almost out on his feet. In this fight, Dempsey shows flashes of the power that gained him the heavyweight championship of the world. Luttrell is down again.
Lions again. Then Dempsey puts Luttrell through the ropes and out. Luttrell was carried out in an ambulance and taken to Crawford Long Hospital where he recovered. Dempsey took home only $5,000 and the Atlanta Constitution called the fight a disgrace. Well, thank you very much, Pat. That was a grand exhibition for your referee. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I, I think it was a nice fight. It was a good comeback fight for me. The fellow's a tough fellow, and a game fellow, and a good fighter. Well, best of luck to you, Jack, and anything else you might try to accomplish for the future. Thank you very much, Matt. So Jack Dempsey had officially retired. In January of 1950, Jack was voted the greatest prize fighter of the half century in a nationwide poll of writers and sportscasters. He ended his feud with Jack Kearns at the award dinner at the Hotel Edison. Jack Dempsey would go down in boxing history as one of the most celebrated heavyweights of all time. Many champions own a piece of the record books, but only a very few achieve the popularity of the Manasseh Mola, a boxing legend, a true American hero. Ray, let me ask you, were Jack Dempsey to be fighting in this day and age, would he fare as well in the heavyweight division today as he did back in the Fair as well. He'd have a picnic. My heavens, who was there could be the Jack Dempsey? Who could stand up under that vicious attack? No, these young men are, are good performers, but they don't compare with the great Dempsey. The debate will go on. Who is the greatest heavyweight champion of all time? Next time on Boxing's Best, we have the story of a guy who says he was the greatest, Muhammad Ali. Until that time then, for Ray Arcel and Barney Nagler, I'm Barry Tompkins. See you next time around on Boxing's Best. This has been a presentation of HBO. Dempsey. Dempsey. It has the ring of history, of Americana, of a gaudy era that will probably never come this way again. The lyrical nickname, the Manassa Mauler, referred to his Colorado birthplace, but the family left before he could walk. The Dempseys were wanderers. Writer, Jack Fisk. He was part Indian, Irish, Scotch. He had, a, he had the, the ethnic makeup that, that, that reached a lot of people. He was a coal miner. He was a hobo. He rode the freight trains. He fought in saloons. He uh, came up the hard way. Before the world knew him, he was a mama's boy who could be mean when angered. He was a young hustler who earned nickels and dimes fighting in mining town saloons. That all changed when Doc Kearns became his manager. Together, they reinvented boxing. They turned it into big business. Writer-historian, Burt Sugar. 
Paul Gallico called the 20s the golden age of sports. And the first member of the pantheon of the golden age of sports happened July 4th, 1919 in Toledo, Ohio, when Jack Dempsey knocked down Jess Willard, the heavyweight champion, seven times in the first round and almost out. He had made this climb to become our second hero after John L. Sullivan. Hollywood called with a $50,000 offer for a film titled Daredevil Jack. He earned more cash cavorting on the vaudeville circuit. The boxer became a barnstormer. Doc Kearns' son, Jack Kearns. And I remember my father telling me one time that this young guy came in and challenged Dempsey to a fight, and he gave Dempsey a bad time. And then he got hit on the chin and he went down. He talked to my father and he said, look, Doc, I can do that every night. He says, I can fight like hell, but only for about a round. And I'll meet you in Oshkosh or Kenosha or anywhere you want to go, and I'll stay two towns out in front of you. I'll go bang a few guys around the town and get a reputation, and then I'll show up for the night of the fight, and I'll make a good fight of it with Jack. And that's what they did, and they took the show on the road, and that's vaudeville. The Manasseh Mauler became the common man's idol, Bert Sugar. Dempsey used to come in without a robe, without socks, with a Super Bowl haircut. Dempsey was unique. He snarled. He had that patent leather black hair, five o'clock shadow, and he fought like the avenging angel of death. Historian Hank Kaplan. People looked up to him because of that style. It was rugged. It was power. It was toughness. His ability to fire away and stand in under fire against bigger men and uh, the finality with which he completed his, his contests. His career barely survived the discovery of this publicity photo. It showed Dempsey in street shoes pretending to help the war effort. Though he had been given a deferment, Dempsey was now seen as a draft dodger. Jack Kearns. It almost was devastating to him, just personally. And it took him a long time to overcome that. There's really nothing anybody could have done about something like that. But I think that's one of the reasons that Dempsey's personality was such that he wanted to be the good guy. Because there he was the consummate bad guy. And he made every effort not to make another mistake from that point on. So did my father. Dempsey's deception soured the American public. Enormous crowds paid to see him lose. In boxing's first million dollar gate, Dempsey crushed George Carpentier. It wasn't until 1926 that Dempsey haters got what they wanted as he lost the title to Tunney. A year later, Tunney beat Dempsey again. But in the seventh round, Tunney, knocked flat, was saved by the famous long count. Tunney got up to win by decision. Hank Kaplan. He became more popular after the, the second loss than he ever was before. And now after these two valiant efforts against Gene Tunney, he, he won his place back in their hearts again. You know, son, that fight will go down as the battle of the long, long count. He didn't win, but he's still a great favorite and the idol of millions. Is he fighting anymore? No, Jack gave up the ring after that fight. How I'd love to meet him. Fight manager, Marv Jansen. He's my idol. In fact, I told the kids that he's my dad. And they wouldn't believe me. I had to beat up on several of them to make sure that they believed that I could have been Jack Dempsey's kid. The unpopular champion became a popular ex-champion. His restaurant on Broadway became a New York City landmark where he dispensed autographs and kind words and he used his celebrity to help those who couldn't help themselves. Dempsey died a folk hero in 1983, Jack Kearns. I think the thing that made Jack Dempsey the larger-than-life character is the same thing that made Babe Ruth, the same thing that made a Ty Cobb. I think it's the same thing that made a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think it's just that they were meant to be. They're that charismatic person. In Dempsey's case, I think he grew into it. He discovered it was there for him, and he accepted it, and he developed it. 
and he had a combination of being with the most colorful boxing manager in the history of boxing, Burt Sugar. In a day and age when Jack Dempsey was one of the have-nots, he turned into one of the most caring haves in the history of the world, let alone sports.